Can you say something? Hi. Hi. Ubushi, can you say something? Hello. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you well. Thank you. Leah, can we test it on you as well? We still have uh, five minutes. Yeah. Yeah. Good morning, Leah. to turn your mic off. Okay. So they can hear That's it. Yeah, yeah. Okay, thank you for telling me. So everybody is here and then... And you will hear them from the uh, speaker too, so you have to unmute um, this the out too. To the... Yeah. So then, and now you can hear them over there. Yeah. You can speak for the mic. Ah, okay. I can hear them from there. Okay. Yeah, I'm just still getting the logistics in a little bit of an order. Uh, IT, can you also shape, show me how the video is looking from our end? Perfect. Thank you. I can turn it off? Okay. Hi, Chennai. Ah, where are you? Room number three. No, no, no. Three, 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 three. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Three, that's right. Thank you. All right. Building change. Hi. Hello. Hey. <laughs> Chennai. Yeah. Nice, nice to meet you. you. Uh, should you should talk further a lot. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I think we have two minutes more or so. So it's all right. The other two are hmm? the other. The other two are on. Yeah, on them. Yeah. See, they're already there. They're logged in. So that's okay. Which is there and then there. Two minutes? Okay, cool. Hi, good morning, uh, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. Uh, and thank you for making time 
and joining the session. I think I'll request the room door to be closed. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I'm sure uh, people in the room, and uh, it's a very good, uh, you know, morning in Ethiopia. It's always good to back be in the sun uh, and talk about things from a very more positive attitude. Uh, if people are coming from Europe and North America, which is a little too cold and, you know, Slightly depressing, <laughs> at least for me. Uh, so we have a great panel today. Uh, I would say uh, the topic is very relevant. Uh, we are stationed in Addis. Uh, uh, you know, uh, good to see IGF back in Africa. I think all the sentiments have been put together in the last two, three days. Uh, so let's let's get uh, cracking. So the topic is very simple: need for found fundamental regulation for the global south. I want to set the stage very simple. The stage is we want to, I will introduce the speakers. Uh, we have a set of questions. Uh, we would take, uh, you know, the uh, focus would be on Global South, but then we would try to break it up into uh, things which are easy to understand, uh, which people can grasp, and we don't want to put jargons into the context. Lastly, we would also like to have a little bit more of a personal participation, sharing of experiences, and uh, understand the, you know, the nitty gritties of where we stand and how we stand. So uh, thank you for your time. It's a 90 minute thing. Uh, we, ha we are the only people in between uh, your lunch breaks, people who are sitting in the room. So <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm very happy to welcome you all. Uh, just to uh, start with, uh, I think there are buzzwords when you look at AI uh, and it is uh, uh, looked at from a uh, perspective of, okay, it can solve all problems of the global grand challenges. Uh, but when you try to break it up into sectors, when you try to look at, at the pervasiveness uh, in terms of utilization of, uh, you know, availability of data sets, its dependabilities, regulations and you know, the fu uh, fundamentals of regulations, how they are looking at from a human rights perspective. We heard about the OECD principles, inclusive growth, SDGs, uh, you know, transparency, explainability. The last two days uh, have been quite phenomenal in putting these contexts of regulations at the top of the table. But the idea is, how do we really go about it? Are there, you know, fund, you know, there are two breakup points. First is, uh, when we talk about regulation, say, yes, but you have to take one step back. Do you know how the internet penetration is in Africa or in Asia or Latin America? Step one. Step two is, okay, it's, if internet is so bad, then how are you talking about AI? Can we really talk about AI without even getting into the data notion of inclusiveness of data from the global south? Okay, then step three. So I think the modularities of foundations which need to be set out for AI need to actually take one or two step back and then uh, try to again come back to where we are, you know, talking about the regulations. Uh, I would start by uh, uh, the panelists uh, sitting on my right. We have Dr. Rosa uh, Aga. I will not pronounce your middle name because I think I'll make it wrong. <laughs> She's a Natural Language Processing Division Director in Ethiopian Artificial Intelligence Institute. Uh, welcome, Rosa. I would give the floor after some time, but thank you for coming. Thank you for making it. On my left, uh, I have uh, Ms. Janai Sher. I think that's perfect as a name. She's a Senior Program Officer, uh, Africa Innovation. Mradi, uh, how do you, you say Mardi? Mradi? Mradi, very good, thank you. And then online, uh, we have uh, Dr. Urvashi Aneja. Uh, uh, Urvashi Aneja is the founding director of Digital Future Labs, a fellow at Sharon House, and a, a non-resident fellow at uh, Indian Institute of Technology, Mumbai. And not, and not uh, sort of, not last the least, my moderator and my co-lead, uh, Ms. Uh, Leah Gimpel, and she is also online. And she is uh, a senior program officer with the Digital Public Goods Alliance and is based out of Norway. Welcome, Leah. Thank you for your uh, participating from the uh, from the cold. I hope you are feeling much better now. Uh, so, yeah, contextualizing it, I I, I give. So, I, what I wanted to set at the stage is very simple. You know, I I, I said that. How are you thinking about a regulation? The first approach is, oh, let's bring all the people, multi-stakeholder partnerships, people on the room together. Let's talk from the, in the last session we heard, let's talk the citizenship potential. Let's bring the youth in, in terms of regulation. But my question first is, in terms of, to my panelists is, how is the use of these, you know, AI technologies, thinking or thought processes being looked at in the global south? 
and with examples from the sectors that they're working in, from the uh, you know, geographies that they belong to, what is the current thinking among uh, you know, the decision makers and the government. So I will open it with Rosa, and then I will pass it on to Chennai, and then I will take the inputs from Urvashi. We have a set of four or five questions, and after every type one question, we would also open the floor for participants to put in their voices. Over to you, Rosa. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, you can hear me, right? <laughs> All right. Great. Well, uh, just to say a few words about the question. Um, well, a bit long years ago, uh, specifically, let's say, let's talk about Ethiopia. In Ethiopia, artificial intelligence technology is all about just uh, robot development or it's just a robotics. And later, later on, a fear came up. So there was a fear that when we have or if we have this AI technology in the country, then we're going to have like many jobless people in the country. Then currently, the current status is now we get... On the government level, we have uh, started this Ethiopian Artificial Intelligence Institute and uh, spe specifically we have started working on to use this technology and then uh, provide a solution for the problems that we have in the country. So um, now the idea of this technology, what we have in the large community in the country currently is that uh, we are going to use the technology uh, developing instead of being developing country to move to a developed country. So, and then develop different technologies and work with the uh, farmers and they you know, of the, the product that we have in a country for the export. So this is one of our good income for the large uh, population uh, by joining the agriculture. Like that soil or that land can take and then give us a good product. Experts, doctors in different expertise. So, so to reach them, everybody is. So this doesn't look feasible, right? So what we are doing is we are working on the experts, having the system like working same like the doctors. And um, different regions in our country, many women are dying by this because they are not this close.
close by they have to usually they come to a this to treat too late so to get rid of such kind of problems we are working on the expert systems uh, and then uh, put this technology in different regions so uh, overall just to make sure it's overall we are uh, using this technology currently to work or to be as a, I mean to make it as a solution for the sustainable development goals so overall we are working uh, to, digi to digitalize Ethiopia and then later on we are thinking about the job uh, loss, one of the disadvantage of the AI technology, then we will think about that later on. Now let's use the technology to have a solution for all the problems that we have in the country. This is the current status on the technology that we have in the country, even on the government level. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you, Rosa. I think you brought the technology, so I'm looking at the regulations again, because the session would still focus on, but you gave the examples, okay, you need a regulation, so looking at sectors like agriculture and healthcare, primarily, and they are linked to the SDGs, so you're looking at the indicators in SDGs to fulfill them. So, I mean, I would I will come back to, because we, we still would like to bring in the notion of regulation. I will hand it over to Shanae and ask her, I mean, the same question, but, you know, I put this context because of also Mozilla Foundation's work and everything. You know, how are you looking at these parts? Thank you. Thank you so much and good day or good evening to everyone. So I think it's so interesting in terms of thinking about how AI is being interpreted from a regulatory perspective. A lot of what I've seen specifically for South Africa based on earlier research done around thinking AI privacy and data protection was the drive towards regulation is really more so as an economic perspective response. So thinking about economic growth, therefore needing to have regulations that encourage for development of AI in specific sectors. What we've really seen is more growth of um, AI-based solutions within the banking sector and financial services. So you'd find like insurance companies now making use of um, AI-based systems in order to you know, decide what's the risk value of someone. Same thing in banking sector, um, being input also in that space of the idea of the fourth industrial revolution. So they have to participate in this fourth industrial revolution from that particular way. So that was one of the drivers of, of regulation around ensuring uh, protection of privacy as well as uh, protecting as being implemented. Because I think that's another crucial issue that if you're going to regulate, you need to know, and that's from a Southern African perspective, countries have been implementing CCTV comes if we're going to, re how we regulate this system especially if we're then doing it from an economy and I think significantly one of the issues that came up was around um, job loss as the previous speaker has mentioned and um, there was a time when the banking sector people in the banking sector actually were threatening to strike because they felt like they were being replaced by the machines without a contingency plan so one of the points of regulation was really thinking about a should we focus on upscaling people so then bringing in robotics into training schools at an early age so that people can be able to make use of the systems or really count on existing inequality so that even as we are regulating AI we're also regulating spaces particularly gendered inequality oh. the sectors which already have regulation so you mentioned banking and finance and, and insurance needs a separate layer on top of it which is still not existing I would still uh, you know I'm interested um, and I'm so sorry that I'm not able to join you all in person my loss in uh, maybe to start with just kind of thinking about the narratives and how policymakers are thinking about it I think there's a very strong miss the kind of boat on previous industrial revolutions and we can't afford to miss the boat on how one thinks about policy and how one thinks about regulation um, and, and it had the, the couple questions is that if you set up the promise of AI in terms of economic problems, then there is a strong argument because we
don't want to uh, curb innovation, which is perhaps the, the narrative in a European context, but we don't want to over-regulate because what's at stake is socio-economic development. Right? I'm not presenting my view here. Huh? My view is probably the contrary, but I'm presenting the kind of like policymaker view view on this. Um, so, what that means, therefore, is that there is a there is a general kind of sense that we don't want to overregulate this space because we might stifle not innovation but socio-economic development. Um, at the same time, I think what we see is that a lot of the regulation. Um, and maybe I'm, I'm jumping ahead a little bit to your second question, so I'll, I'll try and not do that. But a lot of the, the policy conversation around AI currently is not actually regulation. A lot of it is kind of policy discussions, a lot of white papers, a lot of working papers. And these have de facto become the way of being rather than there being a clear regulatory framework. So to give you an instance of that, so India has a framework for responsible AI. It has principles for responsible AI, but there isn't a set of regulations that uh, enable or support the kind of implementation of that. Um, so what we instead see is a lot of this kind of patchwork policy kind of frameworks. Um, and then picking up on what Chennai was saying, the function of most of these policy frameworks seems to be twofold or onefold, uh, which is really to grow the domestic ecosystem and to spur economic growth. Um, that, that really seems to be the focus. And as a result of that, the focus of much regulation has been about how do we create, an, and not regulation policy, has been about how do we create an enabling environment for the development of AI in the, in the Indian context. So therefore, a lot of emphasis on data, on having open data, on enabling access to public data, uh, on enabling access for small and medium enterprises to be able to compete in the kind of AI marketplace, um, to think about the maybe to take a little bit to connect the dots on the job front as well. Uh, there is a con there's conversation about kind of making India the uh, the garage for global AI development. So a lot of the kind of back end AI work, like the data annotation, the data labeling work, can happen in the Indian context as a kind of continuation of the BPO industry or business business process out outsourcing um, uh, as a new kind of avatar or as a new form of that. So that really is when it comes to AI and as a result of this kind of narrative and as a result of this kind of framing, there's much less emphasis on the guardrails that we need to put in place, whether those guardrails are in terms of kind of procurement frameworks that uh, Chennai mentioned. Uh, you know, India doesn't, we don't have a kind of unified pro procurement framework and, 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 and happens in a kind of ad hoc fashion or whether it's in kind of privacy framework. So India has just put out a new draft of its data protection bill, which does not address really many of the issues that come out uh, that, that arise in the context of AI. So whether it's kind of AI poses, etc., cetera, um, or whether it's kind of guardrails for specific applications. So um, there is a lot of AI being used a lot of, uh, by law enforcement, uh, also by corporations, particularly post the COVID-19 kind of cases, use cases we don't see regulatory frameworks for. Um, but Gaurav, I think your sectors where the regulatory frameworks are already more developed or already a little sector, we do see some activity in the health sector, not as much as the financial. There's really a kind of paucity of regulatory interventions, despite growing number or promise um, that is attributed to the use of AI in these sectors. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Uvashi, for also, you know, contextualizing. So there are, again, you know, if you start uh, looking at the dialogue, there are again two or three perspectives. The first perspective is, at least in the global south, people want to use the technology, so they are actually walking in parallel. We talk about guidelines, frameworks, regulation, but we still want to use the technology. So we want to actually showcase that there is use which is successful, which is of you know of use for the citizens. But we will try to walk in. It's not like you know. I think the EU context is more focused on the regulation and then driving and balancing the innovation by side and then put some type of format of maybe regulation is a heavy word, policy discussions like that. I think the second potential thing is that we are still, you know, there are, we are not, the, the global south is still okay with the use of, uh, you know, typical some malicious technologies which are say okay not allowed in us and like facial techno facial recognition we are okay because i think we also find some
solutions which are more appropriate in this you know balance of things of where we are trying to use it as global south i'm not a representative but i'm suggesting and that thing that that type of that types also gives a flexibility in terms of how these uh, you know the use can be there but now i pass it on to uh, leah uh, and she will she's my online moderator for the people who have come in the room later and she will take the next course of discussion uh, with herself yeah thank you leah please Thank you, Gaurav. And uh, I think you already summed up uh, the first input quite nicely. So I would like to move on and uh, look a bit more on the challenges of AI. And I think some of these points have been already raised. So Chennai mentioned, for instance, that a lot of the discussion is framed around privacy and uh, surveillance. So I would like to know uh, first from Rosa and then from the other participants, to what extent is the malicious use of AI actually discussed? Is there a multi-stakeholder discussion ongoing? in your country or in the global south in general? What do you perceive there as the, as the uh, focus areas? And secondly, how do you perceive the private sector coming into these discussions? So to what extent do they participate? To what extent do they try to influence the discussion? And in that sense, also a regulation that will hopefully come later down the line. So passing it on to Rosa again, and thanks again for joining. And to all online participants, please raise your questions in the chat. I'm happy to take it up uh, and read it out for the participants. Thank you. All right. Uh, thank you. That's, that's a really good question <laughs> that we really need to uh, see. When we work on this technology, we have to see it on the malicious activity as well. Like uh, currently, what we are doing is since it's new technology for us, of course, it's not new for us, for the other world. Um, our main focus is just only to bring the technology and then uh, do the production. That is our main focus. Uh, even though uh, to get the trust from the stakeholders and also from the community, one thing that we have to do is to show them, to prove that the AI technology product that we are developing is safe and also it's not gonna create another uh, problem when we try to solve the problem that they have we are not going to create another problem like uh, making making them vulnerable for any malicious, malicious activities so for that currently um, as a country from what I have noticed and also from the tasks that I have been involving what we have doing is we have been uh, doing this discussion specifically with the stakeholders or with the consumers who are using these products. So uh, we are doing directly uh, in communicating overall with the tasks that we are working with them when we develop these products. And, uh, and then during that, we try to uh, develop and then uh, evaluate or test this product with different level of vulnerability. Because uh, when we approach the public sector or the community, we are saying that we have this problem and then we are trying to solve this problem for you. And uh, one of the main threats that they really want to see from us is um, from the privacy side. Because when we work on this technology, we are using their data, right? When we talk about AI, it's, we are talking indirectly about data. So when we, are, when we ask them their data, they need to assure that it's going to be safe. They need to uh, have like assurance from us that it's going to be safe and not going to be shared with a third person. And then we are going to use it just only for, the, for their product development. So uh, one of the malicious activities that they are not going to have uh, on the data that they, are, that they are going to give us, we show them with different, um, well, what can I say, with different, <laughs> we need to go to with different discussions and also we have to show them with different uh, uh, techniques as well that to prove them that the data is going to be safe and also the products that we're developing is, is going to be safe. But uh, we are not going so far, of course, that is one thing that we have to work as, as, uh, as a country. 
we need to like intensive discussion regarding this like we need to have like some uh, rights and regulations specifically regarding this on the products that we are developing on this technology like uh, what to what kind of level that they have to be tested to what what kind of level that we we have to be uh, we, that we can assure the community and have a trust from them so currently we haven't uh, done that far what we are doing it is specifically with uh, with the stakeholders and with uh, with with a specific uh, conversation with them by doing by showing them that we are doing a different level of vulnerability evaluation on the product so that's what I can say back to you Leah you are you are moderating this one <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> thank you so much so uh, thanks for this implementation perspective uh, uh, Rosa I think that's really fascinating and I would like to pass it on to either Chennai or Vashi uh, please uh, go ahead and perhaps you can frame the discussion more into the direction also of how, what is already discussed on a on a policy level based on what Rosa also said about product development and how they ensure that trust and safety is, is uh, included in the actual product development. Thank you so much. Thanks, Leah. I really like the work that Rosa is doing. I mean, it's fantastic for there to be that kind of transparency and that kind of conversation. So um, really looking at this part of the first my first response, again, South Africa, Southern African context, is um, there's a need for transparency and actually understanding where artificial intelligence solutions are showing up. So before we can even have the conversation on the extent to which malicious uh, conversations are being discussed, a lot of the times you don't know that you are, a decision has been made, made based on an algorithm or an AI. Um, an example of this is usually it actually only outrightly shows up when you challenge a decision. And this was the case, for example, of the South African um, Indian woman who qualified for a loan, but the bank told her no. When she investigated, she discovered that it was actually an algorithm that had flagged her. The algorithm was trained on problematic data because South Africa, you know, historically has been an appetite country that is quite exclusionary. But she was probably the best candidate who could actually afford to pay back the loan, and she or the bank to give them a response. So you can imagine the level of which people actually are interacting with these systems. That's fine. Um, so that was the premise that I wanted to really put in terms of the extent of the conversation. What we've seen has been around surveillance, and I think it's because the CCTV cameras are like there. It's 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 visual. I have conversations on like I don't quite feel comfortable about going into a particular neighborhood. And it was actually a case with the Joburg city of Johannesburg municipality and a civil society called Right to Know, where they were challenging uh, private neighborhoods that had. put in surveillance cameras and their biggest concern was um, if you understand the history of South Africa you would know that people who inhabit certain bodies are immediately flagged as problematic so even if you're driving your car through a neighborhood and you are black and the car is nice you could be flagged as being you know potential thief so there was a need for the conversation and they were rolling them out on a safety and security basis so there was a need for more conversation in terms of like okay you're rolling out this service and it's on a private basis but how do you mitigate against bias that's already existent in the country how do people how can people actually make access to neighborhood so that's where the bulk of the conversation has been and if you look at the digital freedom been making use of surveillance systems to monitor human rights defenders um, and journalists so more that can be done and then in terms of it being a multi base because then we have forums like this and people gather around but from a Mozilla perspective, what we've been doing, a uh, foundation and company, we really think about privacy first and data protection. That's that we are a privacy respecting browser. So for us, we really champion um, community focused conversations and advocacy.
intelligence. We're making use of um, an AI-based solution you know, championing AI-based solution uh, through our, the way in which we open up our voice, the voice data sets that are collected by community through our, the Common Voice Project. And in that instance, we consistently, it's governed from a community perspective. We consistently encourage people who then make use of the data um, to develop use cases to ensure that the community is engaged with. They collect the most minimal data um, and they also explain the potential harms um, and concerns that people might have because at the end of the day people are like what are you going to do with my voice who's going to be able to have access to my voice in order to increase surveillance so we really try to push our own organizational ethics um, around these issues to ensure that we want to have an open source voice data set because we understand the issues around siloed data but we want to do it with intentional ethics and care that's already existent Thank you, Janai, uh, for sharing uh, your perspective. And I think Commons is a really fascinating product, and I would be happy uh, to crush them. Uh, before that, I would like to give the uh, word to Urashi and um, also build on what Janai already said. That the way data is collected and what data represents is obviously problematic when it comes to AI development uh, if the data is biased. And as data is a representation of the world, all the data that is used for AI development is biased in one way or the other. And um, in the Indian context, uh, I'm really curious how this plays out over oh, Russia, because um, you already mentioned that there's a push for open AI or open data to be used for AI training to uh, develop a company. So how is this conversation uh, uh, discussed in the Indian context and what place? And I'm especially also interested in the whole ethic of ex ante and ex post regulation, because as Chennai mentioned, a lot of the problems out after an AI is used, after you made it explicit. So do we need to discuss more also how to make AI use visible and then regulate it before it's actually used? or should we look at the problems that come out of it and then regulate after its use? So please, go ahead. Thanks, Leah. Lots, lots of big questions in there. Let me try and answer some of them. Um, maybe the first thing that I want to say is that, you know, in terms of kind of this framing of kind of malicious use cases, um, I think the, the thing to recognize, which might seem obvious, and I'm sorry if I'm just for restating it, is that many in many cases, the people deploying and developing these technologies don't think they're malicious so neither do the developers think they're malicious nor do policy makers think they're malicious so there is a there is a um, there is a particular way in which these these applications are understood right which is not seen from a malicious lens and which I think it's, it's almost seen from two rose tinted a lens which leads in kind of blind spots to what the harms might be, right? So, so to say that many of these are well-intentioned actors, they're not all malicious actors. And all the harms that arise from AI technologies are not only because of malicious behavior, but because of the number of things that Chen and I talked about and that you also alluded to in your, um, in your question. Um, and to pick up a little bit on what Chennai was saying as well, so it's the surveillance use cases that get the most attention. The TV cameras right there, and because globally we are seeing uh, the use of surveillance technology, and I am saying, saying this point again that we see a lot of surveillance tech being used in the workplace, um, and a lot of and the workplace is where a lot of the surveillance techs get normalized. Um, and a lot of it was introduced during the as a response to kind of adapting to the pandemic or managing to managing the pandemic and it, and it is, it is stuck. Um, and then there's also a lot of lateral surveillance that we see, right? So uh, like resident associations in housing complexes, so on and so forth. So it's not just state actors, it, it's kind of across the board and that's the most obvious one. Um, but the, the harmful use cases extend well beyond surveillance, right? So um, I think something that we don't talk about often enough is the impact on kind of cultural norms and social norms. Um, so whether it's in terms of kind of natural language processing or uh, whether it's in terms of, um, uh, you know, other stereotypes here that we now see with new AI technologies 
for creating art, so on and so forth, uh, whether it's like kind of GPT-3, right? So So we have to kind of look beyond the surveillance use case to understand the the uh, the, the harms more broadly. Um, with the question that you were asking about kind of multi-stakeholder conversations and the role of the private sector, I think this is really important because I think what we see in the Indian context is that there is not enough understanding of how these technology works within within the government, right? Um, and a lot of what a lot of what is being introduced in the public sector, for an example is being introduced as pilots that are being kind of sold to the government and and, and then they just carry on like the pilots pilots just stay um, and the kind of multi stakeholder conversation is really influenced a lot by the private sector and much much less by civil society so civil society is often a part of these conversations but it often amounts to a kind of tokenism um, and the, the 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 real like the, the, the ear, the, the private sector really has the ear of the government, not so much civil society, and and this is deeply, um, deeply problematic. Um, you'd asked one more question, and I forgot the last one. Yeah. Yeah, I think I, uh, I ask a tons of questions. Um, I also ask about ex ante and ex post regulation. Correct. Yes. Um, so I think that's a really good question. I'm so happy that you raised that, right? Because I think. For, for the most part, most of our regulatory kind of frameworks in the context of AI and other emerging tech have been after the fact, right? After these technologies have already been deployed and then we see the harmful impacts. But then it's a little bit like a whack-a-mole kind of strategy, right? Like you're just trying to plug this leaky bridge and it's endless. Um, and even like, I mean, if you look at the EU, the new EU, EU's AI Act in some senses is definitely the most progressive as far as global regulation goes. But by the time it actually comes into force, it's the, the ship would have sailed, right? There would be a new conversation. So the EU Act, for an example, doesn't take into account adequately biometrics. It doesn't take into account kind of new extended reality technologies. Doesn't take into account kind of neurotechnology. And all of these are just a few few years away. And we know how long uh, processes take in the EU and other uh, well-functioning democracies to act for things to actually uh, come into enforcement. So we do need to think about this differently, right? And I think we need to think about how do we build a responsible development ecosystem. So how do we start looking more upstream when we're thinking about governance and not just downstream? Um, and I think for that, and these seem, and these kind of points in one sense maybe seem a little too fluffy or too obtuse or like too long-term, but it's important we don't forget them, right? So um, we do need to think about education. We need to think about who are the people, that next generation of AI developers, that we're educating in the global south. Who are these people? What are we really teaching them? Are they really equipped to take on the mantle of kind of developing responsible AI for the global south? Um, we've done a survey recently on looking at responsible AI computing courses in the Indian context, and we found there were none. Uh, the only where the only place that responsible or ethics came into an educational conversation was around professional ethics. Um, and at a few kind of more senior graduate level conversations, there are these technical conversations on how you optimize for fairness or how you optimize and thinking more holistically. So I think we really need to kind of think about where it's coming from. Uh, what we've seen over the past kind of three decades is that there has been a deal of the commercialization of science. So the applications that therefore make it to market are really beneficial, and that's because of the kind of funding ecosystem. So we need better government spending applications, not just that are commercially uh, beneficial. And then of course, and I'll end there, there is obviously a conversation that is, I think, very vi vibrant in the, in the places like the industrialized economies about just having greater diversity uh, within the kind of developer community and within the tech years, we still have a long way to go so i think it's really really important to have that upstream conversation while we also try and manage these downstream harms thank you so much Avashi. i think there were so many points on i would like to follow up um but given the time restraints i will pass it on uh, in a few seconds just one two things i would like to to emphasize uh, and that uh, is the super important topic and looking more at the upstream uh, impact and how to actually shape and ecosystem uh, to develop AI that is societal beneficial entail the
beyond education. Uh, and secondly, uh, just uh, to mention this as well, there are voices in the AI development ecosystem that actually say, okay, we should stop repairing everything that AI gets wrong and start actually developing good AI with a slow approach, really assessing the risk, assessing the impact of AI before we go into development and deployment. And I think that's a very important aspect as well. So to think about slowing down, not developing fast, breaking up things, but really look at the impact first and then go about developing and deploying. And with this, I will pass it on to Gaurav for the next question. Yeah, thank you. I, I think the you know the, the the question always remains in the in the in the in the nitty gritties of, of the question. You know, we say we should have a multi stakeholder participation. How easy? So I like the comment from Urvashi is tokenism of civil society. Right? You bring in the people, but the decision makers are the one who's making the decision. So is that multi stakeholder really working? You know, I think that is a fundamental. I think the second fundamental which I'm really always talking about is the you know which has been mentioned is capitalist you know thrive all these systems all these uh, infrastructure whatever you call it, they are still driven by money incentive why do you want to develop a social impact ai solutions or regulations in a sense which drive this is people need to know that they can make a trillion dollars that's why it is still going in the banking and you know insurance and these sectors which is wow we are still making money well fundamentally let's again come back to the you know the grassroots which uh, uh, i really like so uh, i think the discussions on the responsible ai set is also important and i think the value of education and long term vision uh, for how and what you are building for a country is important and every country can actually start with maybe one sector not on all sectors you know and say okay we can showcase that example my question is that then how is the public sector engagement you know and to what sec you know extent uh, because we also heard in the first comments on procurement of ai and i want to just elaborate that you know people in at least india whom i have talked to edison maker they think is procurement of ai as procurement of a software right it's not a sdlc life cycle ai ecosystem has a different life cycle okay so i think the procurement idea of public sector engagement is important so my question is simple you know how do you think what are the you know the regulate sort of regulatory bottlenecks which you encompass in all your you know different countries and your personal experiences and how is that notion of uh, you know responsibility as a key concern are they being discussed at all in the ecosystem uh, format or they are you know like a familiar and they keep coming and going yeah over to you rosa i'll start with you again I frame it a little differently, a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay. Uh, well, we have just started integrating this technology with the community. So, uh, what we have been focusing is, as I have said before, just on only on the on like on the, on the development. Um, but what we have noticed is uh, once we have started uh, widely working on this technology. Um, we need to have a policy like a guideline. So as a government level, we have started working on uh, developing this uh, AI policy. Currently, we are developing AI policy for the overall for the country. Which, so which means uh, from now on, when we are uh, developing any products with this technology, before they are going out for the public sectors, they have to be checked, they have to be uh, evaluated that if they have developed based on uh, with the shape of the written uh, AI policy. So this is one of the very good thing that we are working uh, currently as a government level. So with this, which means now we can uh, work intensively or widely with this technology because now the, even the public sector can trust us, uh, can give us their data with with full trust. So we're even we can develop a trustworthy AI from now on, because not just only for one institute, not just only for our institute, but overall uh, AI product that we're developing in our country is going to be shaped with this rules and regulation that we are developing in our country. So. That was one of the bottleneck before to reach with the public to the public sector and then uh, work with them because I, as I have told you 
um, when we start working with this technology, we are working to solve the, the problem that we have in the country. We are, we are working on the level of to solve the problem that we have in the country, like on the local problem. So we are not focusing like on the business, like to, to generate some money or something. So for that, we need intensively the public sector involvement or participation with us to work with us. So to get that, it was a bit hard. It was too challenging for us to, to integrate and work with them because we need data. And also we need to work with them. We At the end, we develop this technology. We are going to give them and convince them to use it, right? So uh, it was a bit challenging, but once we have started working on this policy, first we developed this uh, data, data governance or data uh, rules and regulation. Once we have done with that, now we have a rules and regulation on the data with a data policy. So we are approaching the public sectors with that paper, with, with that rules and regulation. And then with that, we have moved one step ahead and then the next one is to have the overall AI regulation, like all the products that we are developing. With. We, the community has to trust us that the, it has ethical and also um, uh, it's not going to create any problem or it's not going to have, it's not going to be some, uh, be vulnerable for any uh, malicious activity or for other uh, illegal activities. So that's what uh, we are uh, doing currently uh, as, as a government, even as a government label. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Rosa. I, I don't, don't know. I'm not, I'm not looking at you as a voice of the government. You know? I just need your opinion so you can be, you know. <laughs> I just want to add one point. point. I think the, this, this part of where the public sector has a lot of data, which is, you know, because they are accountable and they are to the citizens. I, I would like to add this point to, you know, to Shanai and Sayak. Is this, you know, feasible in the type of way it should work with the public sector because they are the owners of data? Should that also be looked at, that who is the data treasurer? Yeah. Thank you. Thanks for um, putting me on the spot. No. <laughs> Um, so, uh, when I was reflecting on this question, uh, and, and this is something that Avishi had mentioned, it's really important to think about the bottlenecks also from that like political economy context, where it's also power and political will, right? So at the end of the day, when you think about the bottlenecks to, to regulation, it's who has the power to actually drive the regulation. And connecting it back to the point which I earlier said, is like, why is the power? It's about the industry that has the money to determine the direction in which the regulation goes and it's also about political will <laughs> I mean in South Africa and Zimbabwe quite a lot of southern African countries so when you're going to it's going to be a lot of con conversations around um, content moderation with elections coming so that's where the political will is and it's more so in the direction of making sure that um, you protect politicians that like you're really and it's about controlling misinformation but sometimes the way that the controlling of misinformation also ends up you know stifling freedom of expression so there is that conversation around power and political will is one of the bottlenecks right and then another aspect is around um harmonized policy frameworks so i'm really excited to hear rose talk about like the process that they have that ensures that before anything hits the public streets you know it's assessed whereas we currently have a conversation i think there have been so many spaces um to this week that are focused on the fact that the Malaba Convention hasn't passed. Um, so for us as a point of conversation, particularly within the African context, is the lack or the need of at least a guiding framework that would then respond to that question around like data stewardship and ownership of the data. And also, you know, remove that idea of the conversation when we think about data, moving away from that framing of data is gold, data is a, it's people who give the data. It's an embodied experience. So we move away from things that they have as we develop um, regulations. And I think um, another point is around geopolitics, right? So coming back to connecting it back to the elections conversation. Content moderation that happens, it's very difficult to try to get meta uh, onto the table. 
if you're not South Africa, if you're not Nigeria, if you're not Kenya, any other country is actually going to be quite difficult because they've invested in those countries. So then how do you ensure that you get the same protection mechanisms that they've put in place in Europe and the US because you know they're responding to those political dynamics and economic dynamics for a global majority context? And then lastly, um, just building on, on the point of trust, which has been mentioned before by Rose, it's, it's really also realizing that um, in quite a number of global majority cu countries, trust is already non-existent with the public sector. So if you're going to try to regulate um, and hope for, and you know, we're pushing a premise that if you're going to regulate emerging technology, it also has to be a trust basis. We're already working with governments that are, you know, are like, this is the, the my way or the highway. So at the end of the day, you do see technologies being put in place that may have a good impact for addressing health, for addressing access to social services, but people don't trust them because of who is putting that into place. So I think that is my um, locating the bottlenecks when it comes to regulation. No, thanks, Shana. I think uh, this this aspect of data and, you know, I, I, I truly believe that, you know, the supplier of data is the citizen and the people and the consumer so the people and the citizens so in between the ai is just taking the data sort of solutions but that is one aspect so we have to treat people at the center of it as suppliers and consumers in you know, our idea of how do you build trust uh, in the global south where i should you know data and they would ask again for the data so i think that's that's a fundamental uh, bottleneck I pass it on to Urvashi. I, I think I just want to be also aversive of time. We have like almost 35 minutes. So from next question onwards, we have two more questions to go. I would try to club it and then, uh, I mean, actually I'll pass it on to Lea, but we keep our comments short, including me. So over to you, Urvashi. Thank you. Um, same, same question, Gaurav. And, uh, Diversify it as bit. It's all right. <laughs> um, you know, let me try and answer the question around kind of responsible use within the the public sector. Um, so, I mean, I, I think I echo a lot of what Chennai Chennai said before me. Um, I think what we see in the public sector, I mean, if you look at the Indian example, like I was mentioning earlier, there is a kind of commitment to responsible AI principles, but there is a big gap between the responsible AI principles and the actual practice. So there's a number of existing use cases of the use of AI, not only talking about surveillance, but even around kind of welfare um, that are blatantly in violation of the principles. So there is that kind of disconnect and it raises the question of what function that responsible AI kind of framing plays and whether its function is more of a kind of legitimizing framework rather than one that actually provides kind of protections. Um, but obviously, and this goes back to something that you said earlier, Gaurav, like we cannot make kind of sweeping assertions around this and it is, it is there is a need to kind of think about how one operationalizes these principles on a case to case um, kind of basis. Um, but I think it is, and so, you know, what, what it might mean in the healthcare sector might look different for what it means in the agricultural sector and also might be different for specific use cases within those, within those sectors. Um, but I think it is, it is important to kind of, there are some inherent tensions in these principles around responsible AI, which cannot be wished away or may not be actually possible. Uh, you're going to optimize your algorithm for something, your data will have certain kinds of gaps. Um, there be, there will therefore be discrimination. You can't wish it away or imagine that it's not going to be there. See, it's, 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 it's very complicated to realize in an AI context. Um, if you think about privacy in terms of uh, people having an understanding about how their information about them will be used um, and having a certain expectation of how that information will be used, that expectation totally changes in the context of AI systems and, and even your best kind of data protection regulation can't guarantee that. So I think the role of the public sector is really and when we're applying it in the public sector is really to be cognizant of limitations of these principles and to think beforehand or to map out beforehand, to identify those risk mitigation measures beforehand. So that kind of mapping almost of what that ideal function, functionality of a particular, 
who the winners are going to be, who the losers are going to be, who's going to get left out. And when we're talking about impact, it's really important to do that beforehand and have those mechanisms in place. Um, and paper, we need to ensure that actually those capacities exist on the ground. Um, so some things when we're talking about uh, how to do responsible AI or safe AI, but we really need to think in a particular context. So if you're, if there is a human that is administrating an AI based authentication system for welfare uh, distribution being in, in a capital in, in, um, in Addis or in New Delhi, but is sitting in like not have basic electrical supplies and he doesn't necessarily have the wherewithal or the capacity to be able to provide that alternative. So we need to provide that capacity to that last person who is going to be actually deploying the AI to ensure that they're able to provide those missing. Currently, when I see the use of AI in the public sector, we're not really thinking. And I, I'm, I'm plugging a paper that I'm writing currently, um, and I'll share the link, but we've been doing a paper on the digital sector in India. And we've been arguing that it's actually a case of organized irresponsibility. Uh, big translate principle to practice are not in place. And what you have instead is a whole bunch of very well made guardrails kind of doing their best. But the sum total of all of that contributes to a sense of organized irresponsibility. So, so you know, so, so these kind of questions, I think, around capacity, about thinking through the limitations of these frameworks is what is missing right now. And it maybe ties back into the earlier question that you asked, Leah. about the role of the private sector and who is who is kind of framing this right so if it's being if it's being sold as responsible ai is this shiny thing uh, where we don't have to think about implementation then that's that's the kind of context that you get right now um and and it kind of filters through in, into something even like procurement so uh, it, as part of our procurement policies are we only looking at the qualifications of the vendor and thinking about what is the most cost effective solution or do we really understand that technology right so do we understand for an example that these technologies are going to be learning and so the vendor's responsibility is not just a one-time provision of the technology but all these vendors actually have the resources the capacities uh, to be able to actually provide that to be able to monitor that or is it just a kind of one-time hang handover so all of these kind of systems and, and that's the point that you started with i think or right that like it's being thought of as but we need to kind of reframe how we use these technologies in the public sector and the system that we need to design around it to now thank you i think you uh, you summed it up i mean again you know in a nutshell if you are looking at it the in would always remain to level of discrimination we just want the government should they will not say this i think that is a requirement which needs to come again i think the second point is more important on the if you are looking at agriculture you are looking at agriculture's value chain which is huge where are you trying to implement it? Maybe at the initial stage. But do you have an expert in agriculture who also understands machine learning? And you also have a decision maker who understands some part of how the system is working. So there's a component of explainable AI which is tremendously missing in terms of the comp in So if you take the banking example, again, I'm still limiting my remarks, sorry, that people who are at least in the system understand what real in a conduit. Okay, I'll pass it on to Leah, and I think uh, we will open the Pandora's box of open AI a little bit. Regulation, I believe so. If everybody has a high moral ground to do the best thing possible, 
open ai might be one of the solutions and also because she is working in the digital public goods uh, area so i think maybe uh, leah you wrap up these two questions together and then i can open the floor for uh, you know in the room and online participants to ask things thank you yes absolutely thank you gaurav and yes, I think in the last question, let's uh, direct our attention quickly to the aspect of open AI as uh, a means that is currently discussed uh, to gear AI development more towards the social good and uh, include, well, give more uh, capacities to people to really work on AI solutions locally to address local uh, problems. So basically AI that. So I would like to know from Chennai as a as a starting speaker, um, which features you would re you would think is required to be open. for AI to be called a digital public good. So is it open training data, as you mentioned, for instance, uh, the, uh, the Common Voice Project where language data is collected? Is it an open model? Should it be an open deployment of a model? So what would this entail? And what are the benefits at risk of making each of these components uh, publicly available? Are there any specific aspects tied to open AI which need to be accounted for in order to really gear the open AI uh, towards the public good and the attainment of the sustainable development goals. Um, so just to explain quickly what the Common Voice project is. So the Common Voice's Mozilla Foundation's work in right now we've got about a hundred languages, which include um, a King of Rwanda, um, Rwandan language, that's actually the second biggest data set with, about, with over 2,000. Um, and then we're currently working on building up the Kiswahili data set, and we've got use cases in agriculture and finance that have been supported with the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, GIZ, and FCDO. So that project basically has been created to disrupt um, the voice data set space, where currently most of the voice technology solutions that are out there do not recognize um, African speak well, people who don't speak European or American English, um, and they're quite biased towards women, and the data sets are siloed. So our open so data solution in that instance was, how about we create a platform where communities can up the data sets for, by themselves, localize the platform, and then CC0, so that means that anybody can make use of the data set whichever way that they want to. Was creating an, an open training data set, but also opening it up in that um, text being put on the platform that would be discriminatory. So that's the approach we, we took to thinking about open AI, ensuring that it's actually community owned. And all Mozilla does is because of our ethos right from the beginning, support the maintenance of the platform through our product team and our programmatic work. So in terms of um, an area of focus, we started with there, but it you know, it's been a complex conversa conversation when you think about open source because at times, so in the work that you're doing, because we recognize particularly for startup innovations, mm -hmm. they don't want to have everything open because it puts them in, a, in an economic disadvantage. And if we're saying that we want to support innovation, we also then have to think about like what other aspects that can be open. So say for, um, you know, licensing that would be open source and people make cases of which aspects of their work would the kinds of data that they trained, they will be making public uh, and accessible aspects of their work in terms of how they engage with community because when we think ecosystem approach it's just not the data but it's being transparent in how you've done the work um, in terms of the regulation aspect a key thing that we've also been putting forward is like that community-led government conversation of value because we are asking people to contribute their voices and their sentences how do they gain value back from the work open source and because it's CC0 Tech, big tech companies can make use of the common voice data. But for us, it's a big question of 
in thinking about open what are the different models that we can take that do ensure that like shared public goods so we can encourage people to contribute to the public good those who do have the money and the resources and then also work towards with the community what value aspects they think should be implemented to ensure that at the end of the day you know they can create a chatbot that's going to tell them how do i cross the street in addis without always having to think about creating a chatbot that's going to tell them how do i you know like plant things when they're not really planting things so that value of like what's the value at the end of the day of creating this open source um data set thanks thank you chennai uh, i think it's super interesting i would like to pick uh, around open ai and then open the floor uh, to our participants and i, I in our conversation before the panel you said that making data open making uh, an open approach to governance arrangements could you allude on that a bit more preface my comments by saying that i agree with everything that has been said before on i I think we need to just stretch a little bit further and that's what I stretch our thinking on this a little bit further and that's that's what my mark, remarks are intend uh, that that's the motivation for saying this um so there's a lot of conversation about open data open APIs open systems I mean we see this even in the conversation around digital public infrastructure right um and in some and digital public goods and in some sense we seem to be defining digital public goods in terms of these attributes and my concern there or the point that i think we need to think a little bit more about is that we seem to be defining public good in terms of a technical attribute right which is the quality of openness of these systems um and we need and to me it's not the technical attribute that will make these open systems socially beneficial or not but it is the governance structures that surround these technical architectures that will make these systems open or not, will make these systems socially beneficial or not. And I feel we're not paying enough attention to that governance conversation. So in some sense, the open conversation, to my mind, is a little bit of a distraction from that governance conversation, which needs to happen first, or at least simultaneously, um, because there is a danger of open systems, right? Um, and I'll point out two two things that can happen, which are, which we already see. Open systems can fuel innovation. They can catalyze innovation. They can speed up innovation. But going back to the point that you were making, Leah, about slowness and the value of slowing down, open systems can take us in a different direction from that. Right? Already, policy is playing catch up, and it's become almost like I mean, you know, it's become like a truism, right? That like or oh, policy will always play catch up with technology. But the, the, the speed of innovation, the acceleration will become more with open systems and policy will fall way behind. So there is there is a danger there. The other danger with open, with open systems, and this is some of startup ecosystems, but I want to frame it a little bit more broadly as well. Um, so if you, a lot of communities have fought very hard to push back against the open science movement. 
then the most powerful actors are able to exploit them or appropriate them faster and better than other actors can, right? So knowledge systems get appropriated um, by, 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 by more powerful actors. So within within kind of pockets in, in other spaces, there's actually been a resistance resistance to open science or resistance to too much openness and I've called for more kind of conditional kinds of openness right so it's not open for everyone at all times but it's about open for a specific purpose under specific conditions for a particular end goal with the gains going back to the community so for that to happen then you need the strong governance ecosystem right so th that's the point that I wanted to make that if we focus on the technological architectures alone we might actually not not be able to achieve that AI for social good that we're aiming for. Yeah. Thank I, you so much, Avashi. Sorry. Yeah, thank you so much, actually. i just looking at time again. I'm a little... Uh, we have 15 minutes to go. Uh, now, yeah, I mean, see, the, the top topic was foundationing, you know, of, of how we are. And I think we have touched on a lot of foundational problems that... Uh, you know the regulatory or the you know policy frameworks generally have i would ask anyone from the room or also online to give them some you know examples where i think this foundations have been touched upon or where you think that you can actually bring in examples and global south is a big uh, sort of area where people are aspiring to see some good examples from the global south which can be followed up you know so I think South Africa, Ethiopia, they say, oh, wow, these people have done something. Let's try to follow. We, I think the Global South doesn't want to follow the examples. They really want some great examples, which is localized, which they can sensitize with, I think. So anybody in the floor or on, present something, which uh, I can also learn also, please. <laughs> Thank you. OK, oh, yeah, fine. No. <laughs> Sorry, please. Sir. No, so Go far ahead. nothing. No, we have one uh, speaker. Thank you. Ethiopia. Just colleague. Colleague with my sister. Uh, as a person who, have, who has experience in technology, by the way, my background is I had been serving in Ethiopia and Ministry of Science and Technology. So what my sister have all said, we, have, we had been experiencing it. To my understanding, I think re regulations should include and what is wrong. It has also to include beliefs of the society brought here, the culture, the moral, as well intellectual property rights. If all among them are included in our uh, regulations, I think we could have good regulation and inclusion. The youth, the women, they should be included in our policies and our guidelines artificial intelligence if these things are included within our regulations. That's what I feel. Thank you. Thank you so much. Valid points. We have one more on the floor we wanted examples but since you're entertaining questions and comments yeah, right um, what does the new regulatory institution look like when really regulatory institutions don't work even for non AI stuff right there's regulatory capture and and who pays for also private sex systems right and however I think much we imagine a different world, we are still living in a capitalist auditors, auditors, auditing systems that, you know, in the financial world have, and also it's not just about the regulatory system, you know, when my medical device fails or of other mechanisms that reveal the problem of that technology and allows, so where does that lie and how do we define those things? 
thank you so much uh, yes we have one more comment uh, yes thank you uh, my name is Njaga, society organization that work on digital right that's a risky technology for africa we don't have the technology resources but we have the raw materials the data millions of data from illiterate people are not yet protected on data protection so i want to express two perspectives in regulating ai we have to understand we will never have neither security nor privacy unfortunately we are in powerful than legal framework we can build so we have to know that technology has to be built from the ground up so the way for africa that's a long-term perspective but in the short term we have economical problem so, so in this perspective it's more than necessary to conduct risk assessment and risk management of ai technology it's more than necessary but in order to do that we have at least some human resources to do it so in the short term africa need to invest on human resources that can conduct this investigation on risk management and assessment thank you very much now very valid points uh, we we have two more speakers yes please go ahead I, we have seven minutes sure so hello my name is janaina i'm from the institute for technology and society of rio de janeiro brazil and maybe just for making more you know, positive note comment i would like to make an example on how artificial intelligence is being used in brazil uh, particularly in the judiciary to make the judiciary more efficient so we have for example like one called victor called hafa they're not substituting the <coughs> judiciary service works but complementing the work and make it efficient uh, cost um, cost efficient also and i did share an, uh, a study that called the future of ai in the brazilian judiciary that's in english on the um, the chat for this session so if you like to know how art is being used in a very positive way with very positive results in brazil so it can be um, thank you thanks for positive commentary Ma'am, please go ahead. I come to your scientist student, and I'm also a manager of um, Elevate, which is an IT company. Uh, so, as we all know, that AI is a really uh, beneficial thing to do uh, in regards to implementing it. Um, it has a lot of potential to make our world better, but it also has a lot of. It can also cause a lot of our. society right so instead of just using AI to benefit a specific stakeholder or a specific government agency um, why not use it to make 
to increase employability of humans. For example, we use um, my company uses AI-based man management systems. So usually, uh, the main goal of this management systems is to uh, increase their um, profits as well as also increase their employability of different um, backgrounds of people. So. My question is, instead of using AI as a replacement, uh, why not use AI to increase employability and what are we doing in regards to this? Thank you. I think it's an open question, but thank you for raising it. I think there is merit in looking at the side of AI and, you know, substituting the jobs with other jobs which AI might generate and should generate. And I'm very happy that on our panelists, I will still ask Rosa to actually respond maybe a little bit to her if you can, and then, you know, we'll try to wrap it up in the next two, three minutes. Yeah, thank you for all coming this, uh, and it's a great question, especially very important question for us, for developing, for the, de for the developing country. We have, what we have been doing is just importing this technology from outside, and it was not helping us that much, because this technology has been developed by their own data, so when we bring it here, it was not working perfectly, which means the performance is not good that as much as it's working there. So we have decided to start from the ground and develop this technology from here. And when we come up with this idea, uh, we are not thinking to replace what we have or uh, the people's task. What we, ha what we have been focusing is on the main sectors, agriculture, hills, finance, uh, tourist, tourism, all these sectors, where are the gaps, where are the problems that this technology can fill? So we were not trying to replace, for example, for, uh, for, for example, the example that I have mentioned before, for the health sectors, we can build this expert system and then distribute it to the different regions. So we can help many people from dying and also doing this uh, transport, I mean, coming to in Addis. And also on the tourism, we are currently working on, for example, for local translation. For example, when we travel from different, uh, here in Ethiopia, we have like more than 92 language, right? When we travel from one place to another place, it's very hard to communicate, right? That's one challenge that I have been faced personally. So what we are doing is to build a translation, speech to speech translation application, for example. So which means without any translator, we can easily communicate for any purpose that we are traveling to that country. So we are focusing uh, to develop this technology as a solution for the problems, not to replace the tasks that people are doing, just to ease some difficult tasks and then to, you know, just as a solution. That's what we have started on. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Rosa. I just last one minute comments. Uh, Urvashi, I will start with you and then Leah also, and then I will wrap up with the session. One minute each. Thank you. No, Arjuni, I think I think that's that, that's you. If I'm seeing correctly, I mean, like your question is spot on, right? I think that's that's the big question. Uh, I think there is a need for a, for an independent regulator for AI, specifically for AI. Um, the question is, let's allow for that independence, and in the meantime, how do we build that kind of capacity? But I think your question is spot on. Yes, I wanted to say the same very important question, and I think that's that's uh, one of the. Uh, the Moving forward, and I would be really interested to also prolong this discussion beyond this panel to see what we can actually do. And if you have any input uh, for uh, for us, please uh, approach Gaurav on the ground or me, um, because we're also going to write up the discussion that we had here in the session. Other than this, I would I don't want to comment anymore because I have so much things on my mind, but there's not enough time. So please uh, go ahead on the ground with Chennai. Um, thank you. Thank you, Leah. Over to you, Shana. So, so recognizing the money and power dynamic, I really want to then focus on the point of it's important to see technology as complementary, as mentioned uh, by the speaker from, from by the speakers who talked about you know increasing employability and also recognizing that we've been Im we've been importing technologies. So um, you know it's it's really important, particularly from, from an African context, to recognize that 
we've been innovating we've been creating technology for the longest time the challenge really has been with these ais and new emerging technologies that we're being told what's important but we do have an important opportunity to shape the technology that we are going to build that responds to our solutions as long as we see technology as complementary not as the end all and equalizer that we've often been told um, we should be doing by making sure we jump onto all the industrial revolutions and we do it in the language that's recognized recognized um, by the North, but not recognized by us in the global majority. And thank you all. M um, I, I think I would take two points to it. You know, I, I think regulation, you can talk about it. It still demands money. You need, it's a slow process and you need request, you know, require uh, resources to build regulation in a multi-stakeholder. So even that process is required money. I think the second aspect which I want to bring in is that, uh, you know, foundationally, the aspect of bringing, uh, not treating Global South as petri dishes, as data abundance, that you can come and experiment and take data because we have less regulations, and treating it as an equal partner in actually building these regulations. And again, I think the contextualizing aspect and education, can you really, you know, I think the next generation in the next 10 years who will be building these AI, are you letting them, a big question. I mean, I'm fascinated that we had such discussions, but I think the answers are also very localized in the context. So thank you for your time, and uh, please reach out to us as and when you want. And thank you for the speakers. A big round of applause. Thank you, Leah. Thank you, Urvashi. Thank you, Chennai. Thank you, Rosa. Thank you, thank you so much. Thanks, have a good yeah. day.